recently returned from a uh, trip to San Francisco. Uh, I was there for an exhibition of my work at uh, CK Contemporary Gallery there. While I was there, I had an opportunity to go to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and they had an exhibition that was up that I had anticipated, and it was a show of the work of the uh, Scandinavian artist Edvard Munch. It was a really positive experience for me, something I hadn't anticipated. I really hadn't known too much about Monk's work other than seeing that painting that I think everybody else has seen called The Scream. Uh, and I would never had an opportunity to, to look at his work in depth. And it was a marvelous show to, to view and to see. And I came away with some, some thoughts about it that I thought might be of interest to people. And it's the reason I'm really producing this video. One of those for me has to do with the fact that how can you go to a, to a show of an artist who deals with subject matter that is so depressing, so full of intimate, raw kinds of emotions, and frankly find it beautiful. It, uh, it was a question I took away and, and spent some time thinking about. And it's part of, part of the things that I want to share with you uh, in the paintings of Monk that I'd like to look at and talk about. Monk deals with that, uh, that inner world we have of emotions. Depression, anxiety, loss, melancholy, love and death with a very kind of special insight that he pulls from himself. What he does is allow us to step into these emotions, not just as pictures, but as experiences. And it is this ability, coupled with the beauty of how he orchestrates the canvas and creates these images, that elevates his art to the standard we are looking at. He has the ability, I think, to reach in like like the honesty of a child who does artwork. And to that, he attach it, attaches the sophistication of a master painter. In front of us is a scene with all of those feelings I just outlined. He moves us around the canvas, causing us to take in the story and fill it in, thus forcing us to become participants, whether we're willing or not, in these emotions. We view them though from a safe distance that allows us by doing that to comprehend feelings you can't see when you were in the middle of such things. Years ago I created and taught a course called Reading Works of Art, a course essentially about learning how to see. In a large part it was about the magician's tricks, the magician being the artist. With this in mind, how then does Edward Munch the artist give truth to his feelings. Let's start with something very few people pay attention to, something called the ground or what the artist paints on it. In Monk's case, he's working on linen that's covered with rabbit skin glue and then white lead. It looked to me when I was looking at these paintings that he was adding a slight tone of warm background color which becomes non-reflective like a bright, bright white wood that was left there. This is important because it will influence the character of the color of what is put on top of it, making them not as bright and sparkling as they could be. Surfaces of white lead can be very slick, making the oil paint sit on top, or it can be put on so that the pigment sinks into the surface. You could ask, why am I making such a big deal of this? Pretty boring technical stuff, really, but I think it's the linchpin that creates the mood for the work. Let me give you an example. When paint is pushed into the canvas, it makes color soft-spoken. It can be like a person who's withdrawn, quiet, and internal. Unlike, let's say, one of his contemporaries, Van Gogh, who seemed to wear his emotions on his sleeve. Well, Van Gogh paints 
very thick and color and paint and character are kind of in your face. Another thing is the unfinished character of the painting. I thought about this a great deal and thought about how can I talk about this and what can I say that it, it contributes. And I began to realize that these paintings are like sketches by a reporter at trial where photos aren't allowed and things are drawn quickly to give us the true experience of the event. It is a technique he uses like that of Toulouse-Lautrec who he admired and was aware of. And it is interesting to look at this painting of the Trek's work. Three things are really clear. One, if you take a look at just the color in here, look at that sienna and the green in the Le Trek painting. This is a painting of the Moulin Rouge that currently hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. And we can see that same, that same chapter of color being used in the Munch painting. The second thing to, that, that I look at when I look at the Lautrec is the linear or line drawing or curvilinear edges used by Lautrec. And the third is how Lautrec forces us to explore this work of art by the way he sort of bounces us around the canvas. He's playing between lights and darks, lights and darks, and it is kind of a of a visual dance that takes place. And he allows us, in fact, forces us to examine that whole section of the Moulin Rouge. We're beginning, what we realize here is that there's an influence, an influence, a good influence from the Trek. And he has used some things that the Trek used, but it's not like copying somebody else's style to the point where it becomes a painting that looks just like theirs. Now, this is Monk looking at Lautrec's inventions and finding a way of using those inventions that he's, that he's done for his own purposes. But it's here that the parallels end. This is not a gay cafe of Paris nights but a scene of grave concern for the person lying in the bed. It is someone we do not see but are drawn to by the exacting edges of that bed, which are nowhere else in the painting except perhaps a small picture of Christ which hangs over it and is given much the same precision and a similar color to the frame which relates it to the bed. The bed is engulfed in sorrow and concern by the vigil of the figures that seem to have a special story to tell us. And like in the Lautrec, we are forced to examine each figure as he guides us through, through them with the varying spots of light and dark and color, and then the overlapping of people into two groups. It is the kind of thing Henri Matisse would do in the view of his studio painting, but here the information is not about things, but about emotions. Relationships and organization is developed by repeated themes. Relationships here and organization is developed by Monk using repeated themes. The praying hands of the figure in the front are mirrored by the praying hands of the figure standing in the rear. The pattern of the woman's dress on the left being echoed in that of the woman on the rear right of the painting. And one figure takes on special importance and becomes the sounding board that we come back to again and again because it is the stark white of her shawl that to me implies age and an intense relationship. Truth is given beauty through the engagement, engagement that is created in the composition. And it is that composition that guides us to create the story in our own minds and makes it real and makes it truthful. Other examples of, of Monk's work can be seen if you Google it, you'll get really the full retinue of, of what he did, did during his lifetime. But what I wanted to do was use one painting to, in a sense, tell the story that exists and the reason how that story is created in all of his paintings for the most part. Uh, I hope that uh, 
that this has been given, given some meaning to you and, and given some insight into Monk's work. It, it was interesting for me to do and think about. And I invite you to uh, subscribe to my ongoing uh, discussions. And also you can view my own work, if you care to, at William Nichols Fine Art. Thanks very much for your time.